We continue to talk about the good news story, the first in first out narrative of China's robust recovery. To what extent do we see the strength in China's recovery being able to lift growth across the region? So thanks for, for having me on. Um, yes, China is uh, was the first to uh, succumb to this pandemic and it uh, dealt with the health consequences pretty pretty vigorously in the first quarter. And it's had two uh, quarters of very strong growth in the second and third quarter. And those two quarters are um, are helping the region for sure um, and helping uh, helping the world. I mean, uh, exports uh, from China um, uh, have been growing fast uh, and particularly of, of medical equipment and home electronics, everything that we we need during this pandemic and those of us who are working from home. Uh, but the half-life of that is pretty short. And uh, what we need in China uh, to continue to be able to be uh, a, a lever for, for growth for the rest of the region is a handoff from public supported demand in China to private demand, which is what we are assuming in our baseline for next year. So in terms of risks that you're listing, certainly one of them is a resurgence in the pandemic. Uh, broadly, though, it's the escalating U.S.-China tensions on all fronts, trade uh, technology. Um, Australia is a case in point of, of sort of bearing some of the brunt of that. How, what does that mean for the region if it's not going away? Well, it, it is a it is a big risk. Uh, it looms very large. Um, trade, technology, finance, all of geopolitics in general. Um, and one of the things we we have been very concerned about is if this spins further out of control and there is a broad decoupling of technology hubs, not just the U.S. and China, but technology hubs across the OECD, that would indeed have a chilling effect uh, on the region, a fairly further chilling effect uh, through reduced trade in high-tech products, uh, less, less efficient production, productive structures uh, in the economies of Asia, and less knowledge diffusion. So that, so that is a problem. Now, to speak to you know, how this affects Australia, I would say um, a lot of the trade between uh, China and Australia uh, depends on final demand uh, in, in, us, in, in China. So um, it's not as if a lot of those goods are part of the supply chains that uh, affect China and other, uh, other countries in Asia. So as long as China final demand is growing at a healthy pace, I think to some degree, Australia and New Zealand would be insulated, but it is a, it is a, a big problem for uh, for the world as a whole and for the region. Um, these geopolitical tensions and trade tensions, and we we really uh, want to see all parties um, uh, get back to uh, trying to support a rules based multilateral system, which has okay. served uh, the world so well. So, how deep is the problem? How big is the problem of rising income and wealth? inequality. We've seen it around the world for a long time. The pandemic has made it worse. When you look at Asia, when you look at countries there, uh, how big of a, of a worry is it for you and, and for IMF uh, economists as you try to figure out what needs to be done next? It's a huge worry. Um, so basically, uh, Asia uh, had seen inequality rising uh, in the years leading up to the pandemic. And the pandemic is having uh, a devastating effect uh, on, on certain groups, on women, on youth, on informal workers, and uh, those with low skills and those at the bottom of the totem pole, uh, those who are in uh, low-skilled, blue-collar jobs, informal workers. Uh, and so inequality is rising, and we are seeing uh, a lot of people slip into extreme poverty uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, in South, in South Asia. Uh, so this is a problem. And it needs to be uh, it needs to be dealt with vigorously through targeted fiscal support to reach those who are being uh, really adversely affected. Uh, it is within the reach of policymakers through targeted fiscal support to address this problem. There has been a lot of support, but more does need to be done.
So, Jonathan, obviously the kitchen sink has really been the approach that a lot of governments have taken when it comes to fiscal and monetary policy support. When do we need to start worrying about the systemic financial system risks? Because there's conversations happening at the moment in, in a lot of people that I talk to that are getting really concerned, not just about debt overhang, but debt inefficiency taking place in economies in the same way that we've seen China go through over the last few years. So there are uh, two phases uh, of this of this crisis. Um, there is not a sharp dividing line, but one of the key messages uh, that uh, we feel is appropriate is that we not um, pull the plug on fiscal and monetary support before the uh, the recovery has uh, a more solid legs, is more entrenched. Uh, that would to to pull the plug prematurely would actually be self-defeating and be more costly in the long run mm -hmm. uh, than keeping that support going. That doesn't mean uh, that we don't have to worry about financial risks building up. Um, uh, there there are surely pockets of vulnerability, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, prudential authorities need to be monitoring those very closely uh, and be ready to to tackle them. Uh, at the appropriate time. So so we, we cannot lose sight of those risks. Those are there. To what extent do you think the, the recovery that we're seeing, the nascent recovery, is going to be damaged if we have a later than expected rollout, a less effective than expected rollout of a vaccine? Well, I want to be optimistic. I think there is uh, tremendous upside potential uh, from uh, early development and early distribution um, uh, of a vaccine uh, that is effective and that reaches broadly uh, throughout the world. Uh, and that may require multilateral support, but there is, there is a lot of upside potential uh, to the world economy from, uh, from uh, an early de deployment that is broad and uh, universal, reaching all countries and all groups within countries. So that is an, an upside and something that we've talked a lot about mm -hmm. in, in our flagship products. Uh, the downside, uh, indeed, is is dark, um, and uh, we, we we may have this is a marathon, not a sprint, and we may have to contend with second and third waves, and we may have to make do okay. Um, okay. with uh, all of the social distancing, masks, all mm -hmm. of the measures that we have in place now, varying degrees. We may have to keep those uh, okay. for quite okay. some time uh, in the absence of an effective vaccine and effective treatment. Jonathan, zeroing in specifically on Australia and New Zealand, the uh, IMF report says central banks have to maintain lots of stimulus. When you discuss this, are, are you and your team in favor of negative rates? Uh, New Zealand has left the door wide open. That could even happen in 2021. Uh, Australia, RBA may be a little less enthusiastic, but buying more bonds, even looking at negative rates, seems to be on the table. Is this the right path for these countries? So both Australia and New Zealand have been tremendously proactive right from the beginning when they saw what was coming. They took a whole variety of measures uh, from reducing policy rates uh, to buying up assets, yield, uh, yield curve control, um, term, term funding facilities. In both countries, uh, this full uh, gamut of measures uh, have been deployed. Uh, and I think both countries are very cognizant of the fact uh, that output gaps are wide and going to be persistent and inflation is going to be subdued for quite some time. And um, we, we don't really get into the particular uh, measures that would be most effective uh, country by country. This is something we discuss with the authorities, but um, th there, there is room to do more in both countries given the outlook for inflation and output gaps. Uh, but the details might be uh, country specific, including uh, negative rates in some cases, but it's not something that we are are pushing actively in, in either.